I, if I were China, I would not be terribly worried about U.S. sanctions. I mean, really seriously, uh, China's four times larger than the U.S. Uh, it's perfectly capable of doing without at this stage uh, practically anything the U.S. might be supplying to China. I will say the reason why or a major reason why China uh, has developed uh, into the largest economy in the world and the strongest industrial economy in the world by by a very substantial margin, um, is that it did not follow the neoliberal prescriptions. The, 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 although there's a strong inroad of neoliberalism in Chinese academic thinking, the reality of Chinese policy so far has been largely pragmatic and has been largely oriented toward specific problems as they arose and confronted the state in one way or another. And then that's one, sort of one step at a time and, and generally speaking, quite cautious. And that has been proved to be to serve China very well. And my sense is that what has happened in the U.S. as a result of neoliberalism has been the effective destruction of the ability of the government in the United States uh, to monitor, supervise, uh, provide guidance, provide leadership for major technological initiatives. Uh, that you really have to have an independent capacity, the one that is not completely under the control of private companies, uh, not, and that is able to set a direction. It's what we had with the Manhattan Project, the, uh, the, 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 the space program, and any number of things in the middle of the 20th century uh, were, in fact, you know, considered to be, in fact, an earlier too, that even in the 19th century, these were things that government did and did quite capably. But all of that was wiped out uh, in the last 40 years. Uh, so it's very hard for me to see that the U.S. is going to actually use these tools or be able to make these tools pay uh, in an effective way. Uh, countries which have maintained that that sort of autonomous capacity to think about new technologies are in much stronger position. I, if I were China, I would not be terribly worried about U.S. sanctions. I mean, really seriously, uh, China's four times larger than the U.S. Uh, it's perfectly capable of doing without at this stage uh, practically anything the U.S. might be supplying to China. And I don't know what there is that's of any great significance. They, um, In the case of Russia, the idea that was promoted in the West two years ago was that the sanctions of Russia was so dependent on Western technology, Western finance, that uh, sanctions would simply both cripple the Russian economy and turn the Russian people and also the so-called oligarchs against the Russian state. First of all, a very silly idea that Russia somehow needs Western money. What for? Right? I mean, for everything that's that's related to the military and most things that are related to civilian life, Russia issues its own money. Second point was Russia really need Western components. You know, they need Western technologies. Uh, for what? Uh, the answer was, well, yeah, they were using a lot of Western components, aircraft, automobiles, and appliances, and all kinds of things. And they were buying a lot of, of food, cheese, wine, poultry, so on and so forth. Well, with a case of things like cheese and wine, well, these are easily not, they can be substituted for uh, quite readily. In the case of the of you know, durable things, machinery and so forth, uh, they discovered that they, they could, and they had been discovering for a decade that they could substitute things they can produce themselves. They didn't really need to buy things from Germany and Japan, let alone from the United States. And so they continued to do this. And at the same time, Cutting off the flow of natural gas to Europe or cutting it back meant that the energy prices inside Russia were stable, so that there would be good raw materials for Russian business. And Russian markets for Russian business expanded because Western competition. And so an economy which had been deeply colonized by the West was largely decolonized. And the Russian economy, after a period of, short period of adjustment, has taken off. Uh, so the effect of sanctions on Russia was, in many ways, I've said the equivalent of a gift, really. There were steps that the Russian government would not have taken on its own. They would not have kicked out Western firms. They would not have imposed capital controls. Uh, they didn't, there were lots of things. They, the oligarchs didn't want to have to choose between Russia and the West, and the sanctions forced them to choose. Um, and all of, these, all of these things have worked to strengthen the Russian economy and weaken the European economy. So there is behind this idea of sanctions a certain amount of condescension 
about the capacity of Russia or China. I think that there are some industries these days which cannot be deglobalized. If you really had a full decoupling, I think the most likely thing is that some of these major industries would simply not be viable. They'd collapse, which would have very serious consequences. Uh, you know, this is this you can see if you want to see a, a smaller scale uh, of the same phenomenon, think about what happened in Yugoslavia, which had an automobile industry. When the country broke up, the automobile industry collapsed because they, and, and that was also true when the Soviet Union broke up and you had suddenly international borders and, and certain kinds of activity simply fell apart because they couldn't be sustained. Uh, and they were sustainable as a as a single unit, but they couldn't be sustainable across these kinds of frontiers. So the decoupling of the United States from China is going to have some consequences of that kind. Um, so and I hope it doesn't happen. I hope it can be uh, forestalled uh, and that sensible policies will, will prevail. There's absolutely no reason for a conflict between the U.S. and China. I mean, what? Interpret U.S. policy toward China, really going back to 1949, in a different way, that it's substantially oriented to trying to destabilize China internally. And you think about, I'll tell you that my father was posted to India as ambassador in the early 1960s. Uh, yeah. And at that time, the U.S. and the CIA were dropping guerrilla units into Tibet to try and upset Chinese control over Tibet. That didn't succeed. And you think about Xinjiang or Hong Kong or Taiwan. These are all part and parcel. At some point, people need to grow up and realize that this is not, you're not going to destabilize China uh, anymore. I think it, that that a you know, sensibly, sensible person would realize that there's, there's no problem that can't be resolved peacefully between the U.S. and China. So it strikes me that you know, part of what's going on here is inside the U.S. is a political matter, that uh, uh, there's a there's always been a need to have an adversary who can support the military budget, and that you can see that shifting all the time from, you know, um, and it's, a, it's largely a question of internal politics and propaganda. 